I think if there's somebody who could, is ready with a question, can you please raise your hand now? So there's one question over here. Thank you so much for the presentations. No, I have a question for you. So when we see fake news, misinformation on social media, how should we react? Not at all, should we report it? Because like you said, when we comment on it, when we repost it, that is a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is where we have a limited ability to really influence the algorithm. But I would say um, probably ignoring it is safest if you think it actually violates a policy, which not all misinformation does. The platforms change, have complicated policies that change all the time, but at least like during the pandemic, um, certain vaccine and COVID misinformation was policy violation. So absolutely that you can flag and they'll, that'll go to the queue of moderators. Um, if it's a specific, like a friend or relative who posts it, you could send them a direct message explaining it. Just keep in mind that the commenting is what's giving the value to the algorithm. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask Noah, so basically you say that we have control on the algorithm, so isn't it like something that is totally connected to education? Because if today we see fluffy puppies, but the girl next door sees posts that, I don't know, um, encourage her to take supplements from some kinds, so you say that we need to encourage education in some kind. I would love to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, I mean, it, we have limited control, and I don't want to claim that the education is in lieu of other things. It's more like we need more regulation, we need, need the companies to stand up and do better. We need everything possible to try to improve our information ecosystem. While we're waiting, and regardless of the outcome of, of legislation and everything else, instead of sitting back and just saying, well, let's hope that things get better, in the meantime and in perpetuity, we might as well do what we can individually to make our own experiences slightly more positive. So this is not to say we don't need the other solutions. We need everything. I, again, I'm, I'm just going to jump in one second whilst... I don't know if Susie's still online. There was one question specifically related to you know, regulation, and it says, Susie, can you see the ombudsman role extending to social media? Then you can challenge what is transparent without, without platforms um, fearing public release of information. So I don't know if Susie is there or not. Um, so there's another one, robust regulation is the key, what can be just suggested and done to improve things. Then the other one it says, if social media algorithms are so easy and basic mathematical equations, how come it is so complicated mm -hmm. to get a grasp and actually control the algorithm? In other words, not everybody's a mathematician like Noah is. <clears throat> so, is Su boom, Susie there? Yeah? Cool. And I don't know if she heard the question. Okay, and this is part and parcel of tech, yeah? You're always looking at a screen somewhere, you don't know where you are. You face blank screens. And if that's not working? Yeah, and if not, I'm going to jump to Maria for a second. Maria. Yeah, another really interesting panel. I, I wanted to, um, to contextualize it and contextualize Karen's presentation more than anything else. Um, I've heard a lot of conversations around race, misogyny, ableism, heteronormativity, but we've not spoken about, and I've seen citizenship as if it's something to be um, celebrated. I work with undocumented migrants and asylum seekers, and one of their biggest problems is being able to open a bank account. They have social media, they use social media, it's an incredibly powerful tool for them, but they don't have personhood. And, and a couple of times now we've, we've mentioned the importance of philosophy and, and thinking. Um, in, in, a, in Malta we sell citizenship, we're good at that, we've commodified it. So rights have become a commodity that we can buy, but you have to be super rich. And not having access to an identity, in other words, not being a person, is a real problem. So even, I don't know who just said, but somebody mentioned EU citizenship and some kind of EU, well, they would be denied that 
personhood. And I just, so, just wanted to sort of situate this as to why it's such a massive problem it's okay. It's okay. for millions and millions of people around the world, not a few. Yes. No. Millions and millions. And then, of course, you've got race, ethnicity and everything else intersecting with that as well. So a little bit of context as to how that impacts people in the real world and who's human and who isn't. Mm. I don't know I mean, if anybody wants to react to that. In the meantime, I think... Is Susie there? No, there's another question. Because I think Susie had to get on a train. It was real life, I think, happening in the meantime. Please. All right. Thank you. My name is Manuela from Medac. And my question is directed to CZ and the last speaker. So I don't know if we'll wait for Susie to come online. I asked a question yesterday. It came up today. And I just want to ask again. So the last speaker spoke about how governments are slow in reacting and combating disinformation. And Susie spoke about the role of the rule of law and government checks. My question is, how do we draw the perfect percentage of the role of government in government censorship vis-a-vis -vis media democracy? Hmm. Because sometimes and mostly the whole argument is that government is overlapping human rights. Yes, so we all agree that government has an essential role in combating disinformation. How do we draw the perfect line? When is the government acting directly for censorship and we all agree as media democrats? And when is the government overlapping its boundaries? Thank you. I mean, that, that's the very interesting question because we talk about it here, sitting in the Western world, about uh, how we want governments to regulate more and, and, and be more inclusive. Well, we can take a look at China, where you have a social credit system, not just a financial credit system, you know, where you get evaluated on how much liquor you buy in the store or if you're late to work and so on. Uh, and you can ask certain other countries uh, inside the EU where there has been quite a, a dramatic shift in how media is treated and how democracy is treated. And, and in those countries... Uh, if you talk to people there, they are not calling for more government regulation. In fact, they're calling for less. So it, I think it comes back to who do you trust? Where do you lay your trust? Um, and, and in countries where you uh, ultimately don't trust your government at all, uh, that's, that, I mean, that's at the end how revolutions get formed. Uh, and your trust becomes the network and the people that you know. We see in Iran now, for instance, the, the revolution in the streets is going on uh, due to the incidents there. And, and so it all comes back to who do you build your relationships with and who do you trust. Um, and, and here, in, 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 uh, certainly in Sweden and in many other European countries, uh, we still expect the government to step in to help us out against this. But we have actually brought this a little bit on ourselves because we've helped shape all of us here as consumers and the consumerism uh, that we buy products and we buy into things and we buy ideas now and citizenships apparently um, and also buy into ideas like we consumers we adopt political ide ideologies and they sell it to us not always with money but with promising us to feel a certain way to be part of a certain group if you look at the uh, the incident that was mentioned in, in, in um, uh, the murder in, in North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, that was also about a person who felt he belonged to a specific group, a specific type that he felt at home. So I think there's a real challenge in your question because the, balance, the line of balance is quite thin. You want the freedom, but do you want the government to give you the freedom? Or how do you get it? Um, complicated territory, okay? As soon as you mentioned government, governments... Um, how can you get governments to do something? I'm, I'm thinking of Janie's um, comment yesterday and what she did with her group, knowing that you know, if you want to change regulation, it's going to take time. So maybe there's other ways that you can shake the tree right, and see which leaves will fall. And I think that's one approach. And I think one approach, it's always the carrot and the stick that you have to do sometimes with getting people to get something done. One of it is what you... With I'd like to add to that because I think, yeah. I mean, first of all, it was an amazing uh, display of how you actually change something that you don't like. But I think, to me, working a lot with government policy and public policy, I think the real takeaway is, it did change regulation. And a lot faster than it probably would have changed so otherwise. So it depends sometimes on so the, the context the change in, the in regulation and yeah. policy comes through these yeah. actions. It comes by getting engaged. Yeah. I mean, from Sweden, we can, we can submit the uh, <laughs> Ms. Thunberg uh, and, and the climate change movement. Um, and, and what a singular person can do to start a movement, which then leads to regulation being implemented all over the place. So it all comes from what you're doing and what you get together and do together. 
uh, to raise awareness, because then that will pop up also in the algorithms. I mean, sometimes operating as an organic intellectual, we used to call them within the government, the people who are changing the system from within, that is fundamental. Yeah. The thing is to connect with those organic intellectuals within, who want to do something. I mean, we heard change, no? change, change agents and things like that. The most unlikely change agents you know, can be not necessarily the people at the top, but maybe just below the top, but may have a, some sort of influence, I, I think. And I think we've all done it, some of us who have had dealings with governments of various shapes and colors. I'm doing some work with UNESCO at the moment in Africa, and the first question I ask is, if, you know, can you see somebody at this level of government, but at this level who sees something in it for him or her, or her career, to get something done? It's one of the first questions, you know? It's like, because human networks cannot be automated, you need to go back to those. I mean, that's the first thing I have in mind. But it's really complicated territory. How can you get somebody to do something? Do you give them bad news or say there's something really in it for them? And I think in my case, that's the way I've tended to operate for the last X number of years. But in the world of TikTok and things like that, I think you saw from Sean, from Vice, no? As to also how you can use the medium now to get people's attention if, if you think that you don't have their attention. So, yeah, Can I that's, yeah, on? Karen. Yeah, I think I mentioned it yesterday, like going back to basic psychology, you've got to try and tap into an intrinsic appeal for that person at whatever level of government. And I think, you know, a little bit sceptical. It does have to tap in and it is linked to votes when you're in those sort of roles. You've got to think about what will actually change and you've got to tap into an agenda like say citizenship citizens is it is a buzzword at the moment it's mm. everywhere but you've got to actually dig deep and what does that actually mean and what can we actually turn that kind of strap line into actual action that's what i like that's why i call myself a pracademic because i'm going well this is great but we actually it needs to do something and again, when you're looking, we looked at privacy and trust, and we did surveys um, across all sorts of age demographics. And what came out was, you know, do, people don't really care about the privacy and trust until it goes wrong. And then you want the government to step in and, and protect me. So we did like a survey around new fintech companies, like because they don't have a brand that people have built up the trust and, and reputation in compared to HSBC or the large incumbent banks. And then if it went wrong, they assumed that the FCA would protect their money, which it didn't. Again, in the terms and conditions that they now have to explain better, you know, it's in there that because they're a new, a new type of organization, that the, the body will not necessarily be responsible for picking that up when you sign on the dotted line. So it, it, it's, a, it's a human, it's a socio-technical problem. It's like the tech is having this influence and we keep going round and spinning through the systems like where does the human have to be in here to be empathetic, to understand the cause and then which human in that system can actually enact to make a difference, to have a push on the power. And that's, it's not always straightforward. That's why this is called, it's complicated because it is. It's not, there's no one straightforward answer. It's like joining the dots, getting people in different positions to think about it, to think about the problem like philosophers, etc., multidisciplinary to actually go, okay, now how do we turn this into action that actually makes a difference? It's not just something nice to have in a, in a policy document. I think that's the difficulty. Another question? Good morning, everyone. I'm Reem Sharha, and I'm also a student of MADEC, and I'm a Palestinian. And my question is basically, uh, with the current, this uh, session is very informative, and we're talking about young people and information. And we're talking about how algorithm, algorithm actually controls what we can see, and all the critical issue about misinformation. However, as young Palestinians, as, as me, myself, I find it more difficult to actually share my stories, my narratives, and we have a huge bias censorship from different platforms when we are going to share what actually happens on the ground. It goes in the terms that it is against like violence promotion, but actually some of the posts that I share personally got censored and it had nothing to do with violence. It was basically sharing what I have experienced that morning going to school or to work. So uh, my question with us having this session uh, for the last two days and talking about how we have to have freedom of speech and have justice and have young people actually manage to have the right information. How is it possible for us to have the balance to share our narrative and actually share what happens on the ground and on our daily basis 
uh, life without being censored. Even though we have learned how to come over our algorithm, we have learned how to post certain things, how to post other uh, things, yet we face a huge bias when it comes to sharing our information. And I'd like to know, uh, what would be your uh, perspective on this? And how could we, as young Palestinians, be engaged? Because we are part of this world. We want to be there. We want to be part of a positive dialogue in this new technology uh, world. So um, thank you. And that is my comment and question. Here you go. Um, so a lot of the new types of systems, blockchain-based systems, are being designed collectively. You could design your own system. I mean, not necessarily you, you could come up with the idea, but collectively, you can create your own social media platform. You can own it, the people. We can take that power away from that. That's one extreme. So I'm saying complete freedom, no censorship, right? And then we have the opposite end where we need some censorship. You, the people, can decide who to include, what centralized points to have. So now we have the other side of the spectrum, and it's not a technology problem. Now it's a social um, policy issue. So we have the tech, but that doesn't answer the scale issue, does it? Mm. I mean, you know, Instagram you and TikTok has, yeah. I, I assume, a megaphone effect. If yeah. we develop our DIY blockchain thing, that we risk an echo chamber. It goes a lot into your, what you were other, saying, Aaron, about yeah. inclusion and exclusion. And this is yeah. another example of, of exclusion. And, and also to, to the point of, of, you know, when you want to change something, how you... <laughs> how you need to affect certain people. One of the reasons that the European Union is getting more active in this, not the only reason for sure, but one of the reasons is that is the EU is seeing that it's getting lagging behind. Most of these platforms that we are using are American. They're not European, and the whole GDPR issues is coming along and so on. So there's quite an American slant to that, whereas in China and Russia and India, there are other platforms with different biases, but certainly biases as well. Um, so... I think we haven't yet found that balance. There is no real European Facebook or TikTok that really can take up the challenge with that and be balanced in a different way. That's not going to be unbiased either, but it can be biased in a different way. And, and, and the, the question of, of the Palestinians in particular, and then there are other uh, areas as well of the world where, where there has been a long-term conflict ongoing which means that all of these algorithms, all these comes are very treading very carefully and, and rather blocking stuff than letting things through. Uh, and you can do the most innocent things and they're going to be blocked. Um, and so, so it's not an easy question to answer because yes, you can build your own platform, but who's going to be on it? Uh, and if you have a platform who's completely open, well, that's great, but it's going to turn into a cesspool quite quickly. So uh, what, what I would add is that it's up to the people. If the people really want it and you join it, people will join. If we don't want it, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. but just, it, it, can I, mean, I read off? Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Here, because it kind of fits in, okay? Selling verified check marks promotes misinformation, disinformation. Who is now the owner of verified check marks on Twitter? Yeah. Mm. Musk, maybe. You know, I'd love some more feedback regarding, you know, malign information. And, you know, you have the time, okay? We all know about fact checkers, blah, blah, blah. I, uh, my feeling remains. That's a survey about all this. So that address yeah. is for, for you guys to, if you want to fill in the little survey there, he put up a little survey on uh, malign information. But first. the dependence on Silicon Valley platforms remains. But here's the other side of the equation. 18 months ago, I did some work for the Asia Europe Foundation. It's not a plug, but it was related to AI and education. We had educators from the Western world and educators from China. And the cultural response to the use of personal data, big data, was remarkably different. And I experienced it myself with a Chinese student in my class, because we, we all show the scary social you know, surveillance thingies. And this chap stood up, and I have a lot of time for him. He was one of my best students, actually. And he said, you guys don't get a full picture. And by the way, we will get out of COVID before you guys get out of COVID because my data, but it was all based on trust in government that it's there operating for your own good. And he said, in the West, you guys don't think your government operates for your own good. If anything, you now think sometimes that the government 
is not representing your best interests. And I just didn't know what to say. So just don't forget the cultural context here. One of the main reasons why with the Tree Seal, we've always tried to get people from not just different, you know, different disciplines, because you have to tackle the problem from a philosophical background, the cultural background, technological background, the educational background, and just see again, shake the tree and see what comes out of it. I mean, Genetis has the impossible task towards the end of gathering whatever has been filtering through the various media we have. These are all media, no? What do we do about it? And there are some ideas, the fledgling ideas, you know, but it's, it's literally challenging. So, Patrick, you want to say Actually, something? And I think I then, in, so, yeah, no, please. I, yeah, and then we'll get to Patrick. It took me a minute, but I thought of one comment I wanted to add about the Palestinian issue, which is um, when I had the formula for Facebook, there was one additional term that I didn't really write or explain in the formula, which is I talked about all the positive things like liking and loving and commenting and sharing, but there's actually one more term, which is Facebook has various um, pr uh, policies that prohibit certain types of things like hate speech and incitement to violence. So there actually is an additional term that's the probability that's not that you will engage, but the probability that the post violates one of these policies. And it has a weight. The difference is that's negative which means the more likely a post is, for instance, hate speech or cyber to violence, the more that post will get pushed down in the rankings. The reason it's important to understand that is if you post something on social media and it gets outright centered, censored, they say this is hate speech or something, even when it's not, at the very least, you can take a screenshot and you can say, look, I'm being censored unfairly, you know, this is... But what I want to say is the problem's even deeper because many of your posts are getting downweighted by some stupid algorithm that doesn't understand the cultural context that thinks what you're saying is a violation. So you can call out when you're like overtly blocked unfairly, but think of all the posts that are getting demoted without you even having awareness of it. So this is kind of counter to what I was saying, which is we're in control a little bit of the algorithms. This is saying you have no effing control over this. There has to be something better we need to do. We need to just not let some private company decide what our speech is allowable or not and kind of secretly demote things without us having even control or awareness. Okay, Patrick, and then we... So, um, actually coffee. hearing you talk made it quite difficult for me to ask my question because I was hearing you talk and I was changing it. But I tend to go very much in line to what Karen was talking about because I work in the sociology of technology as well. Um, I am wondering that... Um, Karen, you mentioned the agency. I believe a lot in um, recursion or recursivity, the dialogue between the technology and the people. I am wondering that in the reality that we're experiencing, how much are we dictating how technology develops or how much is technology actually dictating on how we are evolving? It goes deep, I know, but I, I do struggle yeah. about it all the time, you know? This taps into the deep, the, the dark tracing, yeah. because it's like very subtle nudging to, to suggest you know, what you should be looking at. A bit like the, the Google searches, the prediction. This is, this is like dark tracing that we're starting to look into, because it is subtly nudging you down, down the path which is quite disturbing. I think we mentioned yesterday about, you know, could, could, um, could your household devices, your smart devices hear you because they pick up on different things. And while we don't have any evidence to suggest they do, there was a great panorama documentary in the UK saying it probably does, but again, you cannot get the evidence to prove whether it doesn't. But what, what the algorithm is doing, it's, it's, just, it's just arbitrarily designing what it's, it's told to do. It's told to pick up and create these arbitrary profiles of what we are to market things to you. And so this has now then gone off into this dark tracing, which we're starting to look at as part of this complex online harm. How is this working? Because, you know, it's a relatively new area of, of exploration. But, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, I share kind of like, wh what are we doing here? Are we actually really shaping people, really nudging their, 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 their psyche? you know, about how we evolve and what we should be looking at, rather than, like, trying to, as we all do, trying to encourage our students, critique it, don't take it as fact, you know, don't take what we write down, you know, the, the knowledge that we do is like a bit that all comes together, uh, and knowledge has to go across, like, the horizontal to, to make sense, because like we said, it's just, it, you can't have this blinkered view, it's got to go across it. But there is this, this aspect that, 
we need to explore about the dark tracing. Is it, is it truly nudging? Who controls it? Can we look at it? Um, and, and these are the problems because we can't get access to exactly what's happening. This goes back to Zuboff's work, she calls it, which I like, is the puppet masters, which is the big tech, and we're the puppets. It's a great book if you want to read it. It's about this thick, but it's a great book. Um, but I always think about and in my head, we're still, we're still the puppets. And there's still the puppet masters there, and we don't quite know what they're doing. Like Noah said, we can't quite get access. And it's only when the whistleblowers come out. And, and there's a question there about, should, you know, is it more ethical to be moderated by the public or the private sector? I think it has to be a collaboration between both to hold them to account. But then we, we should work collectively to try and define in our various roles, how we push them sure. to, to be more responsible, to be ethical. Because again, if I asked everybody, what does ethics mean? It's a philosophical question. It would be, it would be rather varied. One final comment, Bjorn. Yeah, go. One for, it's, it's hard. We can we can go on all day. But obviously, we don't have the time for that. It's coffee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but but I want to make one for the comment because, I mean, we talk about the regulation of these big platforms and so on and what they're doing to us. But we have to remember that they are also operating as, as slaves under, under the consumerism ideology. I mean, they're not do, there's nobody on, at Facebook going, oh, I'm going to see how many I can manipulate now. <laughs> you know, let's be evil today. Uh, it's all about making money. You know, if I, if I build a smarter algorithm, if I build something that pe more people will appreciate, we can get more comments and more likes and more interactions, and then we'll make more money, right? And there's a power in that for us. I want to end on a positive note because it's hard, it's easy to get it hardened. There's another power in that. Apart from using the technology to our advantage and using the blockchain and all that, we're also all consumers. And we had that coming up here in the discussion. Very few people of the next generation are using Facebook at all. They're voting with their feet. That platform is less and less yeah. relevant for the next generation. And so... Old, old ways of handling that will go away and new ways will permeate and come up. Now, we can help them do that and we can use the technology in different ways, but, but A, I don't think there's evil involved. I think it's profit involved. So our powers as consumers shouldn't be discounted because we can also choose to not actively promote things on the platform. So we can choose to not even be on certain platforms. I'm, I have an account on Twitter, but I haven't used it for, for a long time because it's a cesspool of of unfiltered information. So there is some faith in that, that Facebook as a platform is growing less and less relevant and has to fire people and is struggling to find a way because people don't find them relevant.